important evening of the year in which we hold a memorial for, for many reasons, which I will quickly go through. But I want to say first that um, I'm Pat Hines, and I'm speaking for the sponsors and co-sponsors of this event. The sponsors being the American Friends Service Committee, that's Jeff running by, uh, director of it, and the Nuclear Free Future. And would everyone who's on the uh, steering committee of that raise your hand here. Okay, and uh, have you asked? Ellen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Ellen wonderful, like, yeah, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful <laughs> activist group. Um, and if anyone has questions or interest in nuclear free future, have you raise your hand? Uh, Jeff, myself also, and anyone else could um, tell you about us. Uh, what I want to do is draw your attention to a couple of things. First of all, we have buttons, nuclear free, uh, nuclear free future buttons that for which you could make a contribution. They're at the front desk. And They're bumper stickers. Bumper stickers and the Vermont Yankee Evacuation Zone, which is a sign for your yard, which a uh, donation of $7 would cover that. And you can see Hattie for all of that. Uh, secondly, we have an email list for those interested in nuclear free future. What that means is if you signed it, you would get not terribly frequently, but just extremely important information on uh, both activism around uh, Vermont Yankee and also significant articles on the, the state, the failing state of nuclear power nationally and internationally. Schedule for the evening. Um, first of all, we will see a film uh, about nuclear winter, and it's occurred to me that nuclear winter was actually the original climate change event um, uh, 9th, uh, 1945. Between the two, almost 200,000 people were <coughs> virtually incinerated into ash in a matter of seconds. And of course, many hundreds of thousands who survived lived um, the most difficult of lives afterwards. And the Hibaksha, of whom you're familiar, and, and once in a while we do have one come through the valley to speak, the average age of them today is 78. They are still committed to educating the world about that experience. And recently, I think it was just after Fukushima, if I'm right now, they came out against nuclear power, uh, heretofore having been singly against nuclear weapons. I think it's also an evening to remember the millions, hundreds of thousands, two millions of people who have been victims of nuclear power. No one here would question the fact that nuclear power is the evil twin of nuclear weapons. It was sold duplicitously by this country in the Eisenhower administration as atoms for peace. And so we remember the victims of Fukushima lost completely tens of thousands, their home, their life, possibly their cultural roots. And also the 200,000 to a million people estimated to have died as a result of Chernobyl. So I think the um, final point of connection in this awful circle of connection is the fact that first of all nine countries in the world have nuclear weapons. They have been reluctant to actually meet, negotiate in, 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 in serious and substantive ways. They've boycotted international meetings that have happened this year. And uh, finally, we have the tension of war created over Iran. Uh, primarily by the United States and Israel, and also North Korea, nuclear weapons being at the heart of, uh, of and one of the radical roots of those conflicts. So we have many reasons to meet tonight uh, in memorial on, on August 9th. We welcome our speakers, and also we'll start with the film. So Jeff Where we are in our society. And I want to share with you a little bit about my story. 68 years ago today, I was living in New Orleans. I was a bride. Uh, my husband had been in the Army. He was a physician. He was a major stationed overseas for three and a half years. We weren't married until he came back. But he came back um, once a month um, and uh, because he was on a troop transport. 
So I was living in New Orleans and he was coming into New Orleans soon. And he had told me that there was a rumor in the military that we had developed an atomic bomb, that they had successfully split the atom. And uh, because he was going into radiology, uh, which then was a comparatively new specialty of medicine. And so, you know, he knew what that meant. And uh, he had, we talked about it. So I was, remember, I was in New Orleans ironing a place map in our apartment at the corner of Dumaine and Charles. <laughs> and I, I literally unplugged the iron, didn't finish ironing the place mat, and went out really walking the streets of New Orleans, trying to find, you know, really someone to talk to about how I was feeling, and thinking there might be an organization that was working uh, in promoting peace. But I ended up in a used bookstore, and the proprietor was a very nice man who agreed with me and listened, and he said, I think you should start reading Tolstoy. He said, I think Tolstoy is one person who understood the banality of evil and writes about it. And so uh, that's where I began. Uh, Tom. Then we moved to Rochester when the war was over in a couple of weeks, and he took up his residency at the Strong Memorial Hospital. And we were both, you know, really eager. He was going to resign his commission in the Army, and we were both, you know, totally at that point anti-war. I had supported World War I in the beginning, but I was beginning to feel strongly that it was really wrong after we bombed Dresden, and, and I felt, uh, and I was talk, I was living at an international house in New York and working and going to graduate school, and I talked with people who came from here, so that I was ready to uh, come out fully against the war, and. Uh, we went to Rochester thinking, you know, we can organize people there. Well, alas, uh, Leslie Groves, who was one of the heads of the Manhattan Project, was head of the radiology department. So, you know, we had a fig tree garden and stopped talking to people about how we felt. And I started, you know, having children. And so, it wasn't until we got to Northampton in 1951 that you know we were testing nuclear weapons in the atmosphere uh, in the uh, west, and so that we both you know became very concerned about the fallout from the testing. And he had a Geiger counter, and he was you know. Uh, working to try to figure out what was going on. And I was running around uh, cornering the powdered milk, milk market for my children so that they wouldn't get the strontium-90 and cesium-147 that you got in fresh milk because the cows, when they tested in the atmosphere, the radioactive isotopes were picked up by the clouds and often carried across the United States and came down on rain in this area. So the pastures, you know, were all uh, filled with uh, these radioactive isotopes, and the cows ate the grass and picked up the radioactive isotopes as was present in the milk. So after I was working for to get the powdered milk in the children, which they didn't like. I decided <laughs> that there was a political situation. But, and so we both worked to start the same nuclear policy committee. And he was one of the co-founders of the Physicians for Social Responsibility in this area. Uh, and um, 
Later, I worked with the Mobilization for Society, the American Friends Service Committee, Citizens Awareness Network, the Nuclear Free Future Group now, and the Shut It Down Affinity Group. All, you know, good groups doing wonderful work, uh, you know, with deeply uh, committed people uh, to abolish nuclear power and nuclear weapons. <coughs> And Robert J. Lifton, the nuclear psychotherapist, said, the colossal number of deaths clouded our imagination of dealing with suffering and death, causing a psychic numbing, which meant we had deep denial, so we focused on shopping and entertainment. We set about you know, getting speakers into groups, organizing around some Sam Lovejoy after he toppled the tower at Montague, and uh, organizing rallies, civil disobedience at Seabrook, where 1,414 people were arrested at one time. We got people to run for Congress. We worked on the legislature. We had four um, you know, by, uh, ballots here, starting with the freeze, to, to you know, begin to um, stop the nuclear weapons and abolish them here. And you know, we worked on referendums, uh, on trying to work with state governments as they did in Vermont, but Vermont baby. Eh? Anyway, now it seems to be the mode is to share information on the internet to organize. And I just want to say Andrew Larkin's doing a wonderful job with his blog. Uh, and you know, I think he's reaching a lot of time of people. But you know, at during all of this early organizing, we all knew Anna Georgie, who wrote the first book, New, No Nukes, Everyone's Guide to Nuclear Power, a really, really good book. I was reading it in the last couple of days, and it, it's very fresh, and you could use it today uh, as an introduction. Uh, Anna had... Um, was living up at that um, Montague farm. She graduated from Mount Holyoke and went up to the Montague farm with many students from the area. And they were trying to build the new society in the shell of the old. They were farming and um, uh, they had a wonderful community. But she became very involved after Sam toppled the tower. And um, she worked with the clamshell of the Lions, and uh, she went on to be Jesse Jackson's environmental um, person and his campaign when he ran for president. Uh, then she uh, got very involved in organizing in Germany and uh, ended up um, living the next 28 years in Germany and other countries. Her husband was in the diplomatic service. But wherever she went, she organized. And uh, she, since 1991, uh, she's coordinated the International Women and Life on Earth Internet Project with website selections in English, German, and Spanish. And she was based in Germany from 2002 to 2013, and she's moved back to the United States, which is wonderful. Uh, and she wrote in her book, the focus is about the work, the focus is broad and deep on women and our communities, peace, ecology, and globalization. They work with currents and movements worldwide, both against war, corporate globalization and destruction of the planet. That's what the group Women on Life on Earth is. And uh, 
also with many people, projects, and movements for a quite different, peaceful, and more just world. So we want to welcome Anna Georgie. A few corrections for the record. I was the lead author and editor of this book, but 52 people worked on it. We did it with no money. Those were the old days. Um, but really, uh, it was so many people contributed, and after I typed the manuscript for the fifth time, I said, I'm never doing this again without a computer. <laughs> so since then, I've, I'm one of these people who's been a little too overly involved with computers, probably. Um, I haven't spoken in English very much over the last few decades. So, so not wanting to be at a loss for words, I actually wrote out what I wanted to share with you this evening, so I hope you'll bear with me. Um, ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, dear friends, it's a great honor to be with you this evening, and even more to be invited to speak on this occasion, and to follow our dear friend and mentor, Francis Crow. August 6th through 9th have been special almost holy days in my annual calendar since 1975, when, at the suggestion of Randy Keeler, as I remember, a group of Franklin County nuclear opponents fasted for three days on the Greenfield Common. Our message was no nukes, 1945-1975, and some of us still have our green and white silk screened armbands. The local press was present and interested. I remember them asking Randy what his last meal had been, and I even remember his reply, coffee and blueberry pancakes. <laughs> but we hoped that more was communicated, as our message was earnest, urgent, and at the time not so universally accepted that no nukes meant rejection of both atomic weapons and atomic power that we who refused the idea of giant twin nuclear plants in our town of Montague saw in them the same men menace as was visited in another form on the civilian populations of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Today we are not alone. This anniversary is being recognized across the world. Every year moving ceremonies are held in Japan. In Germany, more than 60 various actions are taking place. They started on August 2 through 4 with a public fast in front of the parliament in Berlin. That fast is now continuing through more than a week of actions at Buschel, the military base in a lovely rural area near the French border, where an estimated 20 US atomic warheads are stored. Removal of these last nuclear weapons on German soil has been a major demand of the peace movement for years. In 2010, the German parliament voted unanimously to have the weapons removed. Still no action has been taken. This year, a coalition of peace groups have a diverse program that includes the continued fast, a peace camp, and this weekend, a 24-hour rhythm beats bombs, in English, a musical blockade at all six gates to Buschel, fe featuring speakers, bands, and musicians. Other fasts marking this anniversary are one August 6 through 9 in front of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, and a four-day fast at the British Burgfield Aldermaston nuclear base. Both call for an end to nuclear weapons. And then there are international anti-nuclear efforts such as the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN as the abbreviation and the website. Also Mayors for Peace, calling for the total abolition of nuclear weapons by 2020, which as of August 1st included 5,712 member cities in 157 countries and regions. So Ira is not alone, there's a lot, uh, many, many working for this goal. Back when we fasted on the 30th anniversaries of Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombing, we were learning about the connections between atomic bombs and nuclear power plants, about the radiation that, invisible, lives on in the natural world for years to millennia. 
about the uranium mines in the U.S. Southwest, in Aboriginal Australian lands, in West Africa, about the leaking plants and waste facilities worldwide, and their costs, and that there were safe alternatives. Now we know even more. Also, that a main connection between the military and civilian nuclear programs worldwide is democracy and the lack of it. Also, secrecy and social control, often exercised through the mainstream media, controlled by corporations or their representatives. The truth is not told. The truth tellers are marginalized. The whistleblowers jailed. Every year when we meet at this time, we should reevaluate, I think and say, what is different this year than last, as another digit is added to the now distant bombings of 1945? What have we learned this year as we gather again to remember the pain, shadows, and legacy of Hiroshima and Nagasaki? In 2011, there was Fukushima and the terrible irony that the country that suffered the first use of nuclear weapon, of atomic weapons now had to deal with the worst nuclear power disaster thus far. With Japanese government reports that the Fukushima plants released 700 times the radiation of the Hiroshima bomb. And war flows out daily, as we read even this week. And Vermont Yankee, the Fukushima model reactor to the north, still threatens our community. And this year, what about the now public revelations of the extent of the US surveillance state? and the quite open complicity of the leadership of both ruling parties in this country in extensive and intrusive programs carried out by private corporations in the name of national security. Do you feel safer? It has been interesting to read recent commentary from probably the best known and respected American whistleblower, Daniel Ellsberg, who released the Pentagon Papers in 1971. And I just want to mention as an aside, he wrote an amazing piece on August 6, 2009, which is available at his website, Daniel Ellsberg Org. And it's about how he remembered the bomb and what he brought to it as a 14-year-old who, as a student, that year had, had had as a class assignment the morality of a development of such a weapon. It's this incredible piece, and I really recommend it. And it, it also relates to whistleblowers, his own experience. It's rather long, and I can't paraphrase it tonight, but I really recommend it. Um, what I want to quote from is a more recent piece from June called Edward Snowden's saving us from the United Stasi of America. And he writes, obviously, the United States is not now a police state. But given the extent of this invasion of people's privacy, we do have the full electronic and legislative infrastructure of such a state. If, for instance, there was now a war that led to a large-scale anti-war anti movement, like the one we had against the war in Vietnam, or more likely, if we suffered one more attack on the scale of 9-11, I fear for our democracy. These powers are extremely dangerous. There are legitimate reasons for secrecy, and specifically for secrecy about communications intelligence. That's why Bradley Manning and I, both of whom had access to such intelligence with clearances higher than top secret, chose not to disclose any information in that classification. And it is why Edward Snowden has committed himself to withhold publication of most of what he might have revealed. But what is not legitimate is to use a secrecy system to hide programs that are blatantly unconstitutional in their breadth and potential abuse. Neither the President nor Congress as a whole may by themselves revoke the Fourth Amendment. It protects us from search and seizure, illegal search and seizure. And that's why what Snowden has revealed so far was secret from the American people. Now, I was still in Germany as the Occupy movement grew here and was then more or less smashed. But it did seem successful in forcing open cracks in the wall of denial, lies, and hypocrisy about who benefits from this economic system and which forces really control it. 
and showed the world that there were indeed Americans who did not agree with the status quo of minority rule and extreme income inequality in their country. In so many areas, there are life and death struggles going on here, from attacks on women's health services to revealing and opposing the new Jim Crow justice that keeps so many people behind bars, destroying lives and communities, to the outsourcing of war to unmanned drones, to the absolute refusal to see pollution of air and water for what it is, irreparable damage to our ecosystems and our future on this planet. These are also issues of peace and justice, crimes against humanity and the natural world. However, telling truth to power does not seem to work. The powerful know it, and they don't care. Thus, it is up to, up, up to us to find other ways, telling truth to each other and our neighbors, finding it out, supporting those who reveal it, like Bradley Manning and Edward Snowden. Living almost six years in Berlin, I learned a lot about war and peace, that wars never end, but both their causes and violence live on in individuals, families, and the broader society. Something we know here too, from our experiences with Vietnam, now Iraq and Afghanistan. I also learned about the pain and suffering our country has caused and supports through its military involvements, open and secret worldwide. A lot is known, but not always to those living here. I want to close by saying that just as Hiroshima today is a modern city where people picnic under blossoming cherry trees, so we must, as we remember the past, believe and hold fast to the positive visions that sustain us and offer hope, balancing as best we can our daily efforts to confront injustice and build for peace. Thank you both, Francis, for the um, brief journey across your life and your activism. It's um, so remarkable and uh, so inspiring. And Anna, welcome back. It's wonderful to have your voice, your analysis, um, your goodness, evident goodness here. So we'd like to open up uh, for a while this evening um, to you and to hear from you in terms of things that have moved you, both in what you heard tonight, but also in your own memories of um, the reason why we're gathered here tonight, August 6th, August 9th. Before I do that, I do want to point out that these photos here, Jeff has provided them from the American Friends Service Committee. They, they are original, the original photos are in the museum in Hiroshima. Some of you may have visited it. It's a museum dedicated to the effects of the atomic bombs. Um, so feel free after this session to um, come up and look at those. So let's open it up and to your thoughts and um, your, your feelings. Um, so. Yes. A line from the last or uh, which meant that he could have just easily said, I've, I've become madness. So that uh, madness is ruling uh, the security state. And in the midst of that madness is science. Science, pure science, that created E equal MC squared. And so a science to which we bow down all the time and, and say science is still king when it comes to re resolving things. And I think that that's a fun, and Hanson is on that side. He's on that side of that divide. And I think that if we don't look at the divisions, the philosophical divisions that we acquiesce to, that are weakening us, subverting our own cause, we may never get to where we want to get to. Oppenheimer, who I think, if I'm not mistaken, was the one who said something I've come to agree with, which is that all things considered, <clears throat> even with for medical and supposed atoms for peace, better off we'd be if we had not let that out of Pandora's box and if we could, as impossible as it sounds now, I wonder, show of hands, whatever, shaking heads in agreement with me, and I think it was Oppenheimer who said that we'd be better off without the splitting of the atom. That technology is not safe in our hands. 
and the whole fallacy created around the benefits from it are not worth it and we're not capable of safely carrying into the future the technology. Is that how some of us feel also? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. show of hands, you answer. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to see so many people and we really appreciate that people come out tonight to share and to um, witness uh, this information. Oh, she said to speak. Okay. Coming. And um, uh, again, the Nuclear Free Future Group meets once a month, and we have a, an email list. And we have done, we we brought Charmaine Whiteface and Cecile Panetta and um, uh, Chiho, and you know, always trying to focus this, you know, have this issue be somewhere in your priority list. Um, I just want to give you some good news, which is that nuclear power is really dying in this country. And it's very exciting to watch its last gasps. Uh, four uh, nuclear power plants have closed in 2013, which is a first since, uh, for decades. Um, and one closed because it wasn't economically feasible, another closed because it um, couldn't uh, afford to fix its its uh, malfunctions, and then two just closed in San Onofre, June 6th, Con Edison shut them down because there was wonderful community opposition. That's really what happened. And they got um, um, Barbara Lee and... Um, uh, That's representative. Uh, yeah, and, um, and, and Ed Markey on the case. And they were just not accepting the lies anymore. And the uh, people had done a huge uh, uh, campaign of educating their city uh, governments, like we've done with our, our uh, resolutions and things. So it's. Was on the panel about the panel. Yeah. So, yeah, what happened was the final uh, nail in the coffin of Con Edison's two large reactors, San Onofre. Um, in San Diego, right on the ocean. If you see a picture of it, it's, it's oh, just devastating. It's where all the surfers like to surf. And um, anyway, they brought in a panel, uh, and the panel consisted of the Prime Minister, Nato Khan, who was Prime Minister when Fukushima blew, uh, the uh, NRC Commissioner, Gregory Yasko, who was NRC Commissioner when Fukushima blew, Arnie Gunderson, who most of us know that name, he's the nuclear engineer that analyzes all the problems that nuclear power plants are putting out, and um, Peter Bradford, who was on the NRC commission uh, when Three Mile Island blew. And they had this four hour panel in the town hall, and it was live streamed out throughout the world. There were 4,000 people lined uh, listening to it wherever they lived, and they could, they could document that. Um, and two days later, Con Edison shut down. So um, we're uh, hoping to have such a uh, panel come to uh, Boston and uh, Indian Point. We're working on that. And um, it's unfolding. We don't know if we're going to manage it, but it looks, it's looking pretty good. Um, and, uh, but the other thing is that you know, in response to what James Hansen is saying, there's also Stuart Brand, there's, um, what was the other guy's name from um, the Whole Earth Catalog, the guy, uh, Jane, what was his name? Lovelock, right. So there, uh, there are people who are promoting nuclear power and they're being called environmentalists. Patrick Moore was supposedly the founder of Greenpeace and was going around and still is promoting nuclear power. And if you're not opposing it, your silence is deafening. You, you really have to keep bringing that up. And one of the things that I, I wanted, there was a rebuttal, there's been several rebuttals, rebuttals to James Moore, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Hanson, and uh, oh, it was, it was brutal, the kinds of um, stuff that he was saying is truth. Right off the bat, he said it was caused by the tsunami. Fukushima was caused by an earthquake. 
And um, from there on, you know, his, his, his information is very, very sketchy, and it, it just doesn't hold up. But one of the things that um, came out as, as a response to that was the good news that we have wonderful energy efficiency, which displaces nearly seven times as much carbon dioxide as a dollar invested in nuclear power. The enrichment of uranium with coal fire plants um, is contributing to the greenhouse gases. And uh, you mentioned that, Anna, about um, that the whole cycle is, is really uh, 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 killing us. As, as it goes on, the life cycle equivalent of carbon dioxide basis, wind energy is 24 times as effective at displacing emissions per kilowatt hour. And hydroelectricity is roughly twice as effective. And that the uh, capitalized and levelized costs factored in for the United States wind energy is 96 times more effective at displacing carbon than nuclear power. Other renewable sources range from 20 times to twice as effective. And it goes on about the subsidies that have been given to nuclear power. And we beg for pennies for renewable energy. But in spite of all that, renewable is soaring. And it's soaring right here in Massachusetts, thanks a lot to Deval Patrick, really. Um, he's done a very good job. And Obama has done a very good job of subsidizing renewable energies. Mm -hmm. um, and we have part of our Nuclear Free Future Coalition. Susan is up there hiding in the back row. And she's working with uh, other people in our group, we Nancy first and Doug yeah, mm -hmm. and Connie Harvard, mm -hmm. to solarize Northampton. So if you're living in Northampton, speak to Susan, because you're going to get huge deductions for rooftop solar. And um, so that is really the good news. But when a, an industry is as dangerous as nuclear power is dying, uh, they're cutting uh, energy, the, one, the corporation that owns uh, Pilgrim, Vermont Yankee, Indian Point, and several others, is cutting 800 workers right now as we speak. 10% are going to be cut at Vermont Yankee. That is so dangerous. They can't keep it together with a full staff. We, you know, we just heard about these monitors that went off, and there were two major uh, meetings. One was the State Department, uh, the Department of the Public Service Board for the State of Vermont, holding hearings about whether or not to give them a certificate of public good, and the other was the VSNAP meeting. Vermont Safety and Nuclear Advisory Panel, and none of that stuff about these monitors going off came out from Entergy that was at those meetings. And they just kept it until a whistleblower put it out. And um, the state has responded, Vermont, saying, we need 100% reliability. What do you mean monitors go off five different occasions, and you say there's no leak? And these monitors are made to measure leak, and that's just the latest. Mm -hmm. And they're so, cutting your work staff. Because cutting the work staff. So it's a very, very dangerous time. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is make sure there's not another Fukushima before they shut them down. Thank you. Thank you. Recap that, please. Okay. Do you want to? <laughs> The woman who just spoke, following on Hattie's point about the reduction in force by energy for economic reasons, she said that she works uh, in, for the state of Connecticut counseling people who have lost their jobs. And she recently had someone come in who had been fired, lost his job uh, at Indian Point, fired by Entergy. And uh, his job was he was in charge of safety and inspections, he said. And there was more to the story about the timing in which they fired him so as not, so he's losing his pension or at least a significant part of it in benefits, et cetera. Yeah. His, his colleague was fired there. He lost his pension and everything because he was a whistleblower. He was okay. calling up concerns about the safety yeah. of Indian. Okay, so they also at the same place fired a colleague of his who was a whistleblower, and it's that person who's lost benefits and, and, and pension. 
um, the other thing you said was that uh, after they talked to Weil, this man who had lost his job and the job being head of safety and inspection said that nuclear power plants are not safe, or Indian Point, you know, as a case in point, is not safe. And this is the person who's the expert on yes. site. Okay. So tell us who you are. I'm. Can you hear me? Okay. okay. Uh, so I'm Vanessa, and I live in Amherst. I moved here a little while ago. I do some of the walks uh, with the Peace Pagoda. I just I wanted to briefly say, um, touch up on something that Elizabeth had mentioned. And that is Charmaine Whiteface's trip here. Um, maybe a lot of you got a chance to see her, but she is trying to get a bill passed, the Uranium Exploration and Mining Accountability Act. And um, I know some nuke free future campaigners have met with Jim McGovern, who said he would co-sponsor this bill, but this would call for a moratorium on all uranium mining in the US until all of the mines um, have been cleaned up. So that's a really important bill, and if we can get that through right now, it's, it would be really, uh, incredible, but her website, Charmaine, is defendblackhills.org, and that has a lot of incredible information about the work that they do. Just defendblackhills.org, and that's a really good resource if you want to learn more about the, the horrific uranium mining industry in the Great Plains. I just wanted to say a few other words, um, and so, you know, nuclear power, war, war does not just happen, it is the result of this sort of mindset of domination and a mindset of fear that says we can't trust our neighbors, we can't trust ourselves, we can't trust our communities. This mindset creates separation, and this is the separation that fosters racism, poverty, violence, homophobia, hate, and war. This is the mindset that, that allows this to occur. Um, so I, I just want to make clear also, like we are not imagining a world free of nuclear weapons or just nuclear power, but a world of peaceful people and more open communities and it involves all of these things and so we have to really like bring the movements together and if we can do that then we can create the future that we deserve a future of clean water clean food a future where people are sovereign and free together so thank you um no we just um finished a, a five-day walk, <laughs> some of us um, who are here, uh, from, from here to, to Boston, it was uh, called Remember Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and Build a Nonviolent World, and to under, a nonviolent world, we said, means to demilitarize international relations and demilitarize our approach to homeland security, and also to eliminate poverty, systemic poverty. Um, anyway, it was a powerful walk. <laughs> a little too long a story to go into, unless anyone wants to share a little bit. But thank you, it's very inspiring to be here with you all. Thank you. Thank you. I say this, and I'm not sure what I wanna say, but a couple of nights ago, uh, just before going up, I, there was something on the TV, and it was about it was about Hiroshima, and it showed live footage right after that happened, and it also said that we've never been exposed to that. We don't see that. That's been blanked out from our vision. Well, that remains so powerfully with me to see the horrors that happened immediately after those bombs were dropped. And I'm, I'm not a, I don't go through life by propelling negativity, but I, somehow feel that um, we in this country of privilege should be exposed to this. Around this subject, around this um, potential huge, horrible disaster that has already happened and is waiting to happen larger, that we should uncover all of it. 
And somehow, I, this 30 minute segment of something, I have to research you know, what it was I really saw. I, I don't know, I think we should get this out. I think we need to see this. I think we need to see flesh flame from the body. I think we need to see the horrors. Because otherwise, I don't think we have any idea what we're talking about. So maybe that would help propel this conversation to new levels. I had a fair with the dictionary and saw a picture of the bomb and said, oh my God, my parents never mentioned it to me. What a strange world it would do. Um, it doesn't work. The activism that's out there in all of peace movements across the board does not work. Um, there's a lot of nonviolent crap. And there's a lot of activism that's for form's sake. And unfortunately, no matter what you want to say, peace is, has to be a business because war is a business. Peace must do what GE would do to stop the business of war. We have to compete with them. What do you suggest? <coughs> war tax resistance. I suggest we get to be businesses. We put out our information with the same regularity as the national media. That we come to grips with the economies of scale. In other words, we don't have 30 people. We have 3,000 people. We don't have a million people. We have 3 million people. We organize on the scale of Martin Luther King did. By any means necessary, peace is not a attitude in this business, in the business of stopping war, peace has to become not militarized perhaps, but at least driven with the same commitment that a Marine would make of laying down their lives. It has to come across en masse with vision and a vision of unity, a vision of people moving together, community fostered by movement. And the reason it doesn't happen in our groups, one of the reasons is that one in six people here probably works for the government. It's been that case since 1950 that I know of. One in six of the people that are activists are working for the government. They have unlimited time because they're paid. The rest of us are not paid. I just um, want What Susan in the back just said, go solar, Susan, that's Susan. <laughs> of course, yeah, I want that too. And the cynical part of me feels like so much of the truth of our history, at least in my generation since 1947, is Vietnam. We don't know the truth about Vietnam. I, didn't, I wasn't even aware of 3,000 uranium pits in South Dakota, where is it, you know? There's so much truth that we don't really have. And sure, yeah, I, I guess I would like that. But the positive side, and I think I'll also say that the man who just spoke, the one thing that I think I do agree with you on um, in terms of the courage needed to turn around uh, society to be more peaceful, to not have any more nuclear uh, weapons and power, Bradley Manning is a very big hero to me. And Edward Snowden has come along, and these whistleblowers, these young men, perhaps there's some women that I'm not aware of, uh, but Bradley Manning, in a very small way, just, you know, he released a video of 15 people in Iraq getting blown away. And that's only, you know, a small part of the story. But that, that was a piece of the truth, just like maybe we could put Hiroshima on TV and everybody would see how horrible it is. But it is so hard. And look what's happening to Bradley Manning. It's right. It needs to happen more and more, more and more whistleblowers. Um, but it's hard. I guess I, that's what I feel. And we have time for a few more. I'm 
really like a lot of your people. And, and I worked for the government. Uh, I worked for the University of Massachusetts, and then I worked for the Iowa State University. And everywhere I was, I took this photograph I got from the government because Anna Jerky had it in her book. And it was all these soldiers lined up in Las Vegas watching a nuclear bomb go off a couple of miles in the distance. They must have said, cover your eyes so you don't get the blinded. You know, and that's what our government does to us, for us, with us. And I showed it in all these places. Uh, I mean, the man's right, we have to work harder. But I think a lot of us are doing it. A lot of you are doing it. A lot of you talk to people. I read part of that book and got that photograph. I helped Frances put on some of these in the late 70s and early 80s for a while. She taught me how to use pictures in the art history class that got at real history, which was good. Uh, we are doing things. We have to do better. But in fact, everywhere we are, we've just come back from Iowa in 25 years. In Des Moines, right now, they're doing just what you're doing here. Lots of people in Des Moines. In Ames, Iowa, you may not have heard much about Ames, Iowa, but uh, there's a rock next to the journalism building uh, on the campus of Iowa State, which marks the spot of the bungalow in which they produced one million pounds of uranium for World War II. All of the uranium in the first bombs, all the uranium that went to uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, a million pounds of it. And then they dumped it into the sink. <laughs> they dumped it down the drain. And every 10 years, in Ames, Iowa, the Department of Energy comes back and cleans up a little more of the town and then spreads it around the rest of the town. So people know about this. And people do talk to each other. And we don't all know their names. They're not all famous. But, but we just have to keep talking to each other every chance we get. I'm Nancy from Shelburne Falls. A couple of memories come back. When I was five years old, we lived on the Navy base in Philadelphia. I didn't know what a nuclear bomb was, but I do remember that I had garnered enough information out of the grown-ups' conversations to know that the Russians could come and kill all of us. Then a few years later, we were living in uh, Maryland, uh, very close to Washington, D.C., and things got a little more serious. In junior high school, they trained us how to survive a nuclear blast, where to find clean water, how to deliver a baby, you know, what, what you had to do to uh, make sure you were not ingesting, right? Um, and now, uh, here we all are, doing our best, and I, I don't say this to everyone here because I have a feeling a lot of people are probably doing this, but I talk to people in my daily life and I am finding people who do not know what fracking is. I know a woman who says she doesn't know what global warming is. <laughs> Everybody on the earth should know these things. So it isn't just talking to each other. We have to go out in our communities and, and talk to our neighbors and the people we go to church with and the people we go to school with. And, you know, I don't know what the right uh, approach would be, but uh, the other day I gave a woman a hard time for driving a Hummer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke uh, from, from the heart and from their inspiration. Um, I think uh, there's a couple of people who uh, would like to say something, or at least I would like to hear from, uh, and then I'd like to just end as sort of as uh, with a moment of silence, just to remember exactly why we are all here today and the souls that, that perished and suffered. Um, so first, uh, Andy, Andy Larkin, Dr. Larkin, uh, if you would. So good to see so many familiar faces this evening, so many new faces as well. Today we're brought together in remembrance of the events at Nagasaki. In the 1500s, the Portuguese <coughs> created a port in Nagasaki and began trade. The Christians soon followed. St. Francis Zambia turned up in Fukushima, excuse me, in Nagasaki 
in 14, 1549 and brought Christianity. After a short time, the Japanese were done with the Christians and tried to run them out of town. And they disappeared for some 250 years. And then after Dewey came in and things got more liberal, it turned out there was a district in um, Fukushima called um, Urakami. I probably have my Japanese wrong. And it were, they had been closet Christians for 250 years. And in 1929, they built the largest um, cathedral in East Asia um, for the Jesuits. Fukushima is also famous because it's the site of where Shogun was written. And Puccini's opera, uh, Madame Butterfly, was based upon a true story uh, that apparently occurred in Nagasaki as the town was being opened up. At the start of World War II, um, for, much of the, for much of World War II, um, Nagasaki was left alone, as was Hiroshima. They thought they were fortunate. They did not realize that there were designs. At the start of World War II, there was concern that the Germans might develop an atomic bomb, and the United States felt challenged to meet that. The Germans, under the deepest secrecy of the army, under the direction of Leslie Groves, who also created the, helped build the Pentagon, the Manhattan Project was created to build in the atomic bomb. The Germans surrendered before, without developing a bomb. In April, Roosevelt died, and Harry Truman became president, and Secretary of War Simpson came in and said, Harry, we have this bomb, and he really didn't know a thing about it because he had never been considered important enough to be told about it, because this was all a top secret. Herbert Hoover wrote Truman saying we should end the bomb, end the war as quickly as possible. And the Potsdam decision demanded unconditional to surrender. The Japanese were concerned about their emperor. Apparently, the United States didn't care a lot about the status of the emperor, but time passed, and the war did not end. In secrecy, the men debated about the bombs. There were two types that had been developed. One was the uranium bomb, called the Thin Man. Another was, two others were made out of plutonium. Some people thought that these bombs should not be used at all. Some people calculated why the chain reactions would destroy the entire Earth. But I said, well, it doesn't seem very likely. We can take the risk. There were other um, people, some felt there should be a demonstration to the Japanese military of the might that they had to let them know without hurting innocent people. But what if the bomb failed while they look sort of stupid? In July 19th of 1945, the U.S. Um, tested the first bomb, Trinity, and it was successful, as they called it. And Oppenheimer is said to have quoted the ancient text, now we're the creator, now we are the destroyer. Truman was convinced by all the men around him that the right thing to do was to use the bomb. Leslie, um, and so he gave the order that the bombs should be used when they became available. Leslie Groves privately felt, some say, that the real war was with the Russians. And that as World War II was winding down, the Cold War was beginning, and the Russians were meant, um, mustering troops in their start of more war. Leslie Groves uh, he had a big secret. Billions of dollars had been spent. What was there to be shown? He wanted the Russians to know that we had the bomb. And on August 6, in Hiroshima, it was the uranium bomb, Thin Man, devastated the land. Thousands and thousands were killed instantly. More died from the burns, from the flying debris, and then from the strange radiation sickness that no one had ever heard about before. But Leslie Groves wanted to know what was a better bomb, so with the order to develop drop bombs as they came available, he dropped the bomb 
in Nagasaki drift declared another bomb should be sent. The initial target was Kaokura. Nagasaki was a secondary target. Kyoto had been the primary target, but Secretary of War Simpson, Simpson had been there on his honeymoon and he saw what a beautiful town it was and he fought Leslie Groves and said, you cannot do that. And Leslie Groves had to obey. The plane was flew out and circled Kakura three times, but there's clouds that day. And the plane continued on to Nagasaki. And initially, Nagasaki was cloudy as well. But then the clouds cleared, and there was the cathedral that the Christians had built. And they dropped the bomb right over the cathedral. and they killed everybody. Tens of thousands, other burns, debris, thousands of Koreans died. There were a few incidental prisoners of war, and over a hundred people had fled Hiroshima to the safety of Nagasaki, mm -hmm. only to be victims there. But they survived because presumably there were some people who fled from, Nagas from Hiroshima who got to Nagasaki and died. My father was a radiologist, and I grew up in the 50s. And I say, Francis, that powdered milk was absolutely dreadful. And I never understood why putting that milk on the shelf for three months would get rid of all the plutonium that had half the years of decades and decades. But still, we drank the awful stuff. My father wrote the, the first period book. That appeared, the first paper that appeared in this um, scientific literature about the effects of the bomb, and he described the injuries from the burns, the thermal burns, the burns in the skin, and the fall of the white towns. And I asked him as an adult, well, what was it like? And he had, it, he lots of time had that thousand yard stare that you see in people who have been traumatized. He could not talk. And I suppose that's partly why I'm here trying to talk tonight. He could not talk about it. He said it was like, as many people have mentioned, the firebombing at Dresden, made famous by um, Slaughter Kurt Vonnegut and Slaughterhouse Five, the firebombings of Tokyo killing 100,000 people. Afterwards, Leslie Groves, they people, Leslie Groves sent in investigators to look into the, his cities and he wrote the Manhattan Project, produced a book called The Atomic Bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and they carefully detail the relative forces of the bomb and what they did, and Leslie Groves concluded, why plutonium was a better bomb, you got much more bang for your buck. You needed 100 pounds of uranium to get critical mass. Why plutonium, you could only do that with 10 pounds. It was a better bomb, but the photos of the people who had, were injured and went to the rivers to drink the water, and they died in the water, and more people came, and the corpses were filled with water. The corpses filled the water with their bodies. And these stories were never told because it was bad enough that the Nazis had done such horrible things in the concentration camps, and they were bad. And, well, it just would seem unseemly if we showed the world that we had done the same thing to so many innocent people, and so those stories had been suppressed, and the secrecy has begun. And there are those today who might defend the use of the bomb in Hiroshima, but there is almost nobody who can defend the bombing of Nagasaki. Some regard the bombing of Nagasaki is a war crime against humanity. The nation recently reported the rights and wrongs of her more smart debatable. Telford Taylor said he was the chief, one of the chief prosecutors at the Nuremberg trials. And he also said that the trials, the tests of Nuremberg should apply not only to the vanquished, but also the victors, because war well, crimes against humanity, the winning did not give you an out ticket. He says that he thought that too was a war criminal. 
At the beginning of the war, there was a sentiment that the United States would not target primarily as a civilian, unlike those barbarians, the Russia, the Germans, and the Japanese. But by the end of the war, we were capable of the same types of atrocities. And just for one thing to decide, think how much different the world might have been if the Japanese surrendered before the job bomb was dropped and they never got to show it because it was a secret. Joseph Conrad famously wrote about the horror, the horror in deepest, darkest Africa. I, I believe that the horror, the horror occurred rather at Nagasaki when the nuclear genie was let out of Pandora's box and white men used science to destroy innocent people. It is my hope that we may contain the nuclear genie before it destroys the Earth. There have been previous mass extinctions in the past. About 65 million years ago, Alvarez reports a mass extinction. He finds a thin layer of iridium around the world and he traces it back to a meteor that fell into the Gulf of Mexico. At Trinity, Iridium-137 was created for the first time in history and was laid over the earth as the dust settled all over the world. And it's now a mark of, of time before and after Iridium. And if sentient beings come to our planet in millions of years, they may indeed find the Iridium and say, oh, this is too bad. This was done to them. But when they come to the layer of iridium and plutonium and strontium and all the other nucleotides, they will say, this they did to themselves. I have a reading from this book that uh, AFC was lucky enough to be gifted uh, a few years ago. It's called, uh, For Those Who Pray for Peace, and it's a eyewitness account from uh, the folks at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, I think that the point has been made sort of this early enough today. Um, and the, the details in here are, are a bit uh, on, the, on the less pleasant side. So I think we'll save that uh, for another time. Um, but the striking thing about this book and all the horrors that it contains uh, is the fact that almost every story ends with this, this feeling of hope and resilience, uh, and this by folks who witnessed the worst wars in all of the world. Uh, and surely, if they can maintain a, seri uh, uh, a spirit of resistance and a spirit of resilience, uh, then certainly we, uh, in the position that we hold in society today, uh, with the many less adversities that they based on Ground Zero, the original Ground Zeroes of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, then surely we, we can come close to, to matching their resilience. Um, so I want to, I want to now just, uh, if we could all just take a moment, uh, a moment of silence here to remember uh, what happened uh, so long ago. Thank you, friends. <laughs>